Welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast, where we bring you the most interesting and enlightening conversations around movement practice and how you can become the most heroic version of yourself through pursuing movement that's relevant to your nature. This is a podcast that's going to feature some of the top movers in the world, some of the most amazing movement thinkers, and people from fields that are related to movement as far afield as evolutionary theory, strength and conditioning, and everything in between. So if you're interested in movement, please stick around. And if you like our work and want to support it, please consider supporting us on Patreon because this podcast is completely listener supported. We don't want to take any advertising. We don't want to interrupt your experience of watching the show. So what really helps us get the best thinkers on, have the time to put these together, have the best quality for you guys as far as audio and video is your support. So please consider supporting us and enjoy the rest of the show. Hello, and welcome back to the Evolve Move Play podcast. So our guest this week is Mark Walsh. So Mark is a wonderful teacher. He teaches embodiment based on Aikido and yoga and various other principles. And um, I wanted to talk to him specifically to kind of continue this conversation that I've been having with John Bervaki and other people around how we cultivate meaning in our lives through the development of our character and how different practices can help us. So this is something that Mark has thought about deeply and I wanted to get him on here for us to have a conversation about what it looks like to set up an ecology of practices. And I was incredibly impressed with how coherent and to the point and how much insight Mark had to give on this subject. So I think this is one of the tightest and most directed podcasts we've given. It's very pragmatic and practical and has a ton of insight and engaged. So without further ado, Mark Walsh. Mark, welcome back to the podcast. Great to have you. So today, you know, we've been having this kind of ongoing conversation about um, movement practices as a place to cultivate character. And sort of this idea of an ecology of practices where you cultivate your character. And this is a something I, I, I spoke with John Verbeke earlier this week. I'm speaking with Josef Rusic tomorrow. So I just thought it'd be really interesting for you and I to kind of just bat back and forth the idea of how we can roadmap out what that might look like for the practitioners yeah. on a pragmatic level. Yeah. So that's, that's the theme of today's conversation. Got it. So the sort of starting point would be something like, we all say that, hey, you know, a leader should have these qualities or a man or woman should have these qualities. Yeah. And then that's nice and you end up with a list. And then the next point is like, well, but how, right? And then there's this sort of some sense that um, movement activities are character developing. So this was, you know, the British obviously invented pretty much all the modern sports. A lot of them were sort of ruined and changed in the United States, but we pretty much invented all of them. And the reason we did that was for character development. So all modern sports like soccer, you know, rugby, uh, cricket, all the kind of modern sports that that became, you know, baseball and football and all the great sports that we, after you gave us, um, they were all developed by English public schools and public schools means fee paying schools, which is pretty much not my own background, but I have a certain respect for them um, as character development tools. So there's this saying that Waterloo was won on the playing fields at Eton. Um, and this, but I think there was an era where this was um, normal, but wasn't sophisticated. It wasn't um, targeted, if you will. It was just sort of, oh, it's good for young boys to play rugby or you know American football or something like that. Um, and it was clearly having a positive impact. Um, but then two things happened: one less positive, one positive. The sort of less positive thing was um, that um, sports became a tool for sort of ego and money and you know, the Premier League stopped being a place where you would see the most noble behaviours of humanity, which to the Greeks would have been a very strange idea that, you know, um, uh, you won a little laurel crown or whatever in the Olympics, you didn't get a sponsor, you know, a big contract or a load of sponsorship or anything like that. Actually, um, um, I'm, I'm not sure that, that they did. I, I've read some interesting things about how there was tons of of money and prestige that went to oh. Olympic champions in Greece. Maybe I, I'm misinformed. That's entirely That's possible. Human kind beings. Of important really, conversation. <laughs> human beings. And there's always, there's always other side benefits, aren't there? Sort of reproductive yeah. things. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so one thing that happened is this sort of increasing commercialization of sports and it being less seen as a character development art. Yes. Then the other thing that's happened is a sort of influx of Eastern arts. Um, you know, it's very hard to find a karate teacher in the UK until the 80s, even, you know, starting in the 70s, for just as one example. Tai Chi wasn't popular. Yoga maybe was coming over from India. 
Um, but you know, the, these things weren't widespread. And I think the other thing that's happened is a more sophisticated um, view of how these changes happen. So a sort of a congruent philosophy of embodiment of body psychotherapy is just starting to develop. And this gives, and rather than just sort of throwing a load of character paint at the wall and hoping some of it sticks, there's now a sort of coherent framework. Uh, you know, I've been one of the ones developing it that we can actually look at practices and go, okay, given we only have a certain amount of time and energy, what might we want to do? Or what might you want to do compared to me? Because we have different characters, different lives, different interests. So does yeah. that sort of paint some of the territory here? In yeah, a way? Yeah. So, Perfect. So, um, yeah, that was great. Wonderful background. Um, the, the idea that sport is, has been about creating character, that history is really important. And then also the, the kind of what we get out of the Eastern arts, I think is really interesting. It's something I've been thinking about a lot recently is the idea of like, um, treating parkour, you know, my base sport as a jutsu, as a technique, as a technical form versus treating as a Tao, a way of cultivation. Yep. Yep. Um, so, I, I sent you a message earlier. I've been listening, you know, talking a lot with John Verveke about this idea of a, the ecology of practices. And, you know, he drew this distinction between a meditative practice and a contemplative practice, which is sort of, um, as I understand it, it's uh, a, a meditation practice looks at your ability to pay attention or what the experience of paying attention is internally. And a contemplation practice pays attention to the world externally and how you're paying attention to the world externally. Um, does that make sense to you? Have I got that right? It does, yeah. And I, I think there's sort of two approaches that are going to be very helpful for this conversation. Yeah, the, sure. One would be a kind of ontological approach, like um, embodiment refers to the body as a way of being, as a, mm -hmm. a manner with which we are, yeah, to be the verb to be. And I think that frame immediately helps us start seeing practices as ways to build ways of being, a do, as you put it, rather than a jitsu, like Aikido versus like jitsu. Um, so that embodiment approach is really helpful because once we go, oh, well, I'm not just practicing a football, I'm practicing a way of being. I'm practicing how to be a good loser when I'm playing football. I'm practicing teamwork, you know. And the other perspective, I'd say, more granular, totally compatible, would be that of skills acquisition. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the concrete skills that are being built. For example, you know, anyone in par parkour is learning self-regulation skills. There's no doubt about it. You couldn't do it otherwise, right? And there's other skills that are going to be semi, you know, other skills that are going to be really strong in parkour. Some skills that will be sort of semi there if you're looking for them or maybe consciously try to develop them. Like you could develop certain skills through parkour, yeah. um, like relational skills. Like I was hanging out on your course with these parkour kids and they, they were interacting in a certain way that I really enjoyed actually and I hadn't seen before. A little group of monkeys, you know. Yeah. Um, but they weren't necessarily trying to develop those skills. That was a sort of accidental. And then there's the skills that may be better off learned elsewhere. Like this, you know, I've never seen anyone learn uh, you know, it's not necessarily the best format for learning flirting, for example. <laughs> um, that's very true. Um, one of the, um, this is a class, I'll just say this is a classic thing I see. You know, young man comes to parkour. A lot of the young men who come into parkour are kind of socially awkward. Yeah. They're, you know, they're, a lot of them were good athletes, but they're naturally small or don't have, say, the, the super great hand-eye coordination that makes for a really good team sport athlete. So right. they discover parkour, and all of a sudden, they get to be great at something. Yes. Um, and now they're confident, and they said, so I was changing my life. Um, and But they spend all their time around a group of men. <laughs> right. And they so don't... And, they, and, they, and, and so you're like, okay, so you're so courageous, you can jump between these buildings and do these yeah. and you can't approach a girl still. Right. That's I had the exact experience in your course. I was with these young men and they were doing these great jumps. I was really impressed by them. And I was also really impressed by how they were learners. Like one of them just came up to me and said, oh, Rafe says you know about trauma. I don't know what that is. Tell me about it. And he was just like really open. I was like, wow, you're so teachable. I wonder if that's coming through your practice. But then I went for lunch with, you know, this one young guy and I was just flirting with the girl behind the counter in the, in the cafe and, you know, mutually enjoyable experience, I'm pretty sure. And he was looking at me like I had a superpower. <laughs> and I was like, this is way easier than what you just did. So, so this is the problem of transferability. Um, 
is there skills transfer between the confidence to jump from a branch to another and the confidence to approach someone you find attractive, male or female? Yeah. Like, that, is there that skills transfer and how do we speed that skills transfer up? Or even the opposite, is there a way in which the yoga can stay on the mat or in your case, in the tree, mm-hmm. right? Like, is there a way in which the, the martial artist is getting good at Aikido and they've got their special clothes and their special words and their special rituals and that all helps create what I call a container for the practice, which keeps it safe, uh, keeps the learning effective in terms of skill gradient practices. It makes it simplified. Any practice is more simple than life and less consequential than life. But the very fact that you need to make things more simple, more ritualized, less consequential to make a container also means that you risk a problem with transfer. Does yeah. that make sense? And I think that model of container and transfer and I'll talk about bridges between the two, between life application and pr- practice versus application is a super important distinction. Yeah. Um, I think that really helps and you start looking at, okay, is the container too tight or too loose? You know, if, if you're in a yoga studio where people are hitting on each other all the time, it's not safe, right? If, mm-hmm. you, if, if you're in a yoga studio where no one ever talks to each other ever, maybe you're going to have difficulty getting some of those... Um, self-regulation skills to keep with that example that you'd learn in yoga to a relational context which let's fucking let's face it that's when we fucking need them right mm-hmm. like i get stressed because my hamstrings are tight very often in my life i might get stressed though because i'm getting some hard feedback or you know criticism or whatever so does that help as a kind of yeah another- oh, that's perfect i mean this is right at what i've been sort of interested in right so you know I, 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 as you know um the idea with evolve move play sort of started with this idea that uh, it's not what the uh, man does to the mountain. It's what the mountain does to the man. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an art of self-cultivation. We have to recognize that if we want a sustainable practice that is deeply meaningful for us over the long run, it has to be about what it does for us in a broader context. Yeah. Um, so then you have the question of um, how are you generalizing the lessons? And yes. also are you choosing the tools that, uh, that align with the goals that you say you're like okay this is great for self-cultivation this is great for courage this is great for this it's like well is that actually serving you so there's this idea i have of um i think a lot of people end up serving the the practices that they take on rather than giving the getting using those practices to serve their development and let's actually point to how ridiculous this is like who cares if you, your hamstrings are super long, you can get your foot behind your head in yoga. Mm-hmm. Who cares if you've got like a badass Aikido wrist lock or mm-hmm. a super good jujitsu kind of, you know, neck crank or whatever. Like, how does that actually help your life? Like, you know, if I'm at the point where I've done enough martial arts that I'm, you know, sort of maybe in the top 1% of fighters in the town where I live, do I want to get that to 0.01%? Or do I want to go, okay, maybe my focus should be on what really helps my life here, not getting that wrist lock 5% better. Mm -hmm. And the other key thing is I think people, now we have a lot of choice in practice. People tend to pick the practice that are easy and deep in their neurosis, not the practice that builds the skills they need. So like, you know, back to the one of the young men I met in your course, maybe he'd better off going to a comedy improv course and learning to be like verbally spontaneous than doing more of the tree jumping. And just to finish here, if I may, like Absolutely. the piece around values is key, right? Like I, I created something called Embodied Yoga Principles and I started from, I took yoga, took it apart and said, okay, if this was designed to really help with what I care about, what would the practice look like? And what I came up with was something that's quite different from a posture yoga class. And I'll still say at the beginning of every workshop, I just taught one in Berlin, I'll say, what do you care about? And people will say their families, their relationships, their love life, politics, money. No one talks about being flexible. Mm-hmm. Like no one really cares about that unless you're a professional gymnast or some obscure kind of reason. Mm-hmm. But people get almost parasitized by the practice. And the practice becomes the thing where they have to do the handstand or they have to do the, you know, the technical Aikido like, you know, thing for the, you know, the, the, the absolutely very specific and then this, as you say, they're now serving the practice rather than the practice serving them. Yeah. Or they've just deepened a groove that they already had. And, you know, the aggressive people are doing the aggressive arts and the calm people do the calm arts. And no one's actually building the range 
of skills that we need in life is while it's great to specialize, there's a sort of core range of human skills that we need to be good enough in. It's like you need to be a five out of 10 at all of these to have a decent life. And then it's great if you're a 10 out of 10 at some of them, because then you can get paid shitloads of money for that and you're a specialist. You know, does that make, does that? Oh, does that sense? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so there's a couple of key themes there that, that are really important to me. One is, um, so yeah, going back to, just quickly going back to um, the the trap of of uh, you know obsessing about just getting your leg behind your head or getting your one arm handstand or, or whatever this is that can be powerful that can be a useful quest but what I see is is that people become identified with their 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 discipline and because they haven't articulated fully their why. Yeah. They, they, can't, they can't measure the gap between what is actually bringing them to the discipline and what the discipline is actually delivering for them. It's like, I'm here, I'm getting something out of it, and now I'm attached to it, and I'm attached to my identity. I am a parkour athlete. I'm a tracer. I'm a yogi, right? Namaste all the time. And, and then there's, there's sort of inevitably, in my opinion, a point where whatever your primary practices are, um, whatever you went into them for, they're not even, they're not necessarily the best tool or they're not going to be the best tool unless you can identify what you're trying to get out of them. And it's very easy to get trapped in sort of just, just continuing the loop of what, of your behavior and feeding it because, because it's something that you, you know, it's, it's grown inside you in a sense. And so I think getting that clarity about, the whys that you come in with is, is foundational to developing an ecology of practices that allows uh, the self transcendence that we're actually seeking in all of these practices. Yes. Yes. That makes a lot of sense to me that there's a, a, you know, as much as anything like a clear aim was one level and a sort of clear why behind that. It was like two way two pieces you could kind of articulate there. And one of my teachers always says, you know, for the sake of what, at the beginning of a practice like you know what's the big why here what's the big picture and then you know concretely what are the skills you're building and i think it's real easy to do the things that are fun that are habitual rather than the skill that may be possible to learn in your art but it's like you people work away around it you know you can get around that skill by doing the thing that you're better at to overcompensate for it and there's you know there's i think this is also a, there's also potentially a journey people make where at the start it's unarticulated and it's, it, there's a longing maybe that can be intuitive uh, or there's a plan, but the plan may be the surface plan is I'm going to learn self-defense skills. Yeah. And then there's a deeper longing or a deeper calling that may be a mystery. So I think, I feel like if we're just trying to articulate everything in this very clear masculine way, we could lose some of that mystery and some of that calling, some of that intuitiveness, but being able to separate that out from just liking the smell of our own shit is really important. And that's tricky. That's really yeah. tricky. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. There's this journey that people can go in. There's a certain branch point that I see in all arts where people can go in two directions. And there's a certain point where they go, either they have to step back and have the humility to go back to their own art in a new way or to change arts. There was a time when I moved from martial arts to tango for a year because mm-hmm. I realized I just wouldn't get that musicality and aesthetic and sensuality and gendered polarity that's just not in Aikido in the same way and then now I'm a beginner again and I'm stumbling over my feet and it's humiliating and I'm embarrassed and you know my identity is tied up with being this rough tough guy and there's all those barriers to that Uh, and I think it does take courage to keep exploring within one's art and to move between arts or or, or supplement as it were cross train where necessary this this idea of sort of um person personal growth cross training I think is quite interesting (laughs) yeah yeah so um I I identified this idea uh, a few years ago of like the so you know my work is a generalist mover right that's one of these frames I'm thinking about what, what would it mean to be able to move in general, in the most important ways for a human being. So now you have this idea, what is the generalist human mover? And, um, and so you ha- what I notice about good generalists is that they, they are, they're always sort of in, in conversation with specialists, right? 
So when an MMA gym is always pulling stuff out of jujitsu, is always pulling stuff out of Muay Thai, is always pulling stuff out of Taekwondo, right? Um, and then there's also usefulness for the specialist in, in going to the generalist and seeing the bigger picture and in widening their frame. But um, uh, what I've noticed over the years is that there's kind of two traps that I noticed. There's a, a trap that happens when you specialize deeply in something and a trap that happens when you jump from thing to thing. And the trap of the specialist is not being able to confront the discomfort of being new again, not being able to confront the discomfort of not being good and not being able to confront the discomfort of something else potentially being as valuable as the thing that you've devoted so much of your time right. to. Investment is a key thing here, right? And there's all yeah. sorts of cognitive bias. Right? In Aikido, this is hilarious, the investment people have in something which isn't very practical. Yeah. And even no matter how much evidence they get, the, the investment just beats it. And you see through religious people, the various sort of modalities. Yeah. Sunk cost yeah. fallacy. Of course, yeah, yeah. So you, you've done 10 years of Aikido. You feel like it's changed your life. It's amazing. Um, to accept the idea that it actually has almost no relevance to self-defense, um, yeah. that, that means that your self-conception is profoundly challenged. It means that the, the investment that you've given over all these years is profoundly challenged. Yeah, and my, my friend Rokas from uh, Lithuania, did, you know, he's got a whole YouTube channel, the most popular Aikido YouTube channel. At a certain point, he realized it wasn't that great in a fight to, to, to understand it. <laughs> And, he started, and he's gone on a whole journey with it and he's recorded that journey, but not many people have his humility. Um, you know, he's an exceptional person in that way and, you know, credit to him. Um, yeah. And as you say, the other trap would be something like, tell me if you come to the same conclusion, like not being willing to go deep, not being willing to be bored, to go to, you know, to dig one well deeply to get to the real water. And this is sort of wives versus lovers, right? Or husbands versus lovers. Like, it's like, you know, is that one relationship that you really go into and really devote, devote time to, um, you know, or is it just going around on the surface and, and, and missing the depths of intimacy and connections to stay with that, that metaphor that, that are really there but through dedication? Yeah, the trap of the, of the generalist for me is the unwillingness to continue something once it gets hard or yeah. to continue something once your your values within it or your your relationship to it has to shift and one thing that i've noticed is that often the specialist types are people who don't get things easily and the and the people who fall into the generalist type are the people who get things easily because if you if it was ha really hard to get to competency it's like contemplating jumping into that journey again is really challenging on the other hand if like you go into anything that you try and you get to be better than all the other novices really quickly it's always rewarding so you meet these guys who um you know they're real good at surfing they're real good at you know jujitsu they're real good at snowboarding and mountain biking but they're not great at any of it yeah and a lot of yeah. times they're really fun to hang around and play with because they can kind of do anything with you uh, but it feels to me like there's something that has been missed because they haven't um they haven't done the hard work where the most powerful character development happens yeah. is once you go into a discipline to the point where you hit the plateaus. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, definitely this relationship analogy really works. I mean, there's something about the good times and the bad times and working yeah. through them. Um, yeah. this about that long-term commitment, you know, and, uh, and as you said, it's, it's interesting to know the payoffs for different arts and when they come, mm -hmm. like, you know, the dropout rate of certain martial arts is huge because, you know, everyone's getting choked out repeatedly at the beginning. And there's other things which are like, I think one reason yoga is quite popular is because you can feel semi-competent relatively quickly for, with most body types and you get an endorphin hit, you get a buzz from it, which in say Tai Chi, you're not going to get that physiological buzz quite so quickly. Um, and there's a way in which you can kind of fool yourself you better than you are in some arts for sure. Um, yeah, nice, nice frames we're developing here. I'm enjoying this. Yeah. So I wanted to go back to something you said uh, a little bit earlier. Um, I wanted to go back to mystery for a okay. second. Okay. Because I, 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 we, we have this problem right now, which is that, uh, so 
I, I sent you a message the other day and it was after kind of digesting the Verbeke stuff and it was like, okay, and I started to lay this out. So, okay, you have meditation, you have contemplation, and then your work would be kind of the next level out. It's the relationship of the mind to the body and the experience subjectively of the body. That's how I see sort of embodiment. And then the next level out would be like, how does the body interact with the environment? And that's where say parkour comes in. And then we could say, how does, how does the individual interact interagently with another human being? Now you have dance and martial arts and all of these things. And then you could start talking about, you know, um, we could also look at, uh, discourse conversation contact uh or like improv comedy right. fit in that level and then above right. that you might even have things like crafting and cultivation right. and things and gardening and you can see all of these as pathways to self-cultivation um and we have we have all of these available to us and then we have many different traditions and many different um potentially valuable tools within this so within meditation you know, I could do Vipassana, I could do Stoic meditation, I could do Zen, I could do, um, you know, any number of Taoist meditations, you know, embodiment. It's like, well, do I want to do Feldenkrais? Do I want to do Alexander Method? Do I want to do, you know, body-mind centering work? Marta? This is very concrete for me. Every year we have a course called the Embodied Facilitator course, currently in the UK and Moscow. In a couple of years' time, we're expanding it to cover a few other countries. And every year, people try different practices and they pick a practice. Um, so we've got quite good at helping people select practices for their own personal growth. That's the aim of it. It's not in, there's various models we work with for this. One would be a sort of sequentially a model of sequential complexity. So if you imagine meditation at one end as sort of sitting without adding a deliberate challenge with no social verbal interaction. And right the other end of the spectrum would be something like tantra or improv comedy, which had verbal elements, movement elements, social interactive elements, and degrees of challenge or intensity. And you know, we could build it in between. You might have like, okay, meditation, then something like hatha yoga, then something like partner dance, then something like martial arts. And you could build that up and say, okay, what parts of this have you already covered and what parts of it need work? Because if you don't get into the social, verbal, relational components, you're fucked. You, that, you haven't got the skills for life. You've got it down here as a, a great foundation. You can take someone with a meditation practice and they're going to be better at yoga than someone who doesn't. And someone that does yoga is going to be better at dance practice or movement practice potentially because they're at least body aware. So this is a second way of looking at it from an embodiment point of view is um, four skill sets. So I've um, stolen Daniel Goldman's model of embodied in of emotional intelligence and extended it out to embodied intelligence. And I think that creates four skill sets with two time frames. So this is self-awareness and self-regulation, social awareness and social impact. Like, you can't really talk about social regulation, so like social leadership. Mm -hmm. And they are two time frames. So you can be aware of your state or your patterns. You can change your state or your patterns. So that's like practice over time versus state shift. You can be aware of people's state or patterns, and you can change people's, influence people's state and patterns. And that gives you a really clear, simple model for going okay, what am I good at? Okay, I've done a lot of yoga. That's really good for a self-awareness and self-regulation. Totally shit for social awareness because you're not looking at other human beings in class, right? Unless you were to try and use it that way. Um, leadership. Okay, maybe I want to start doing a tango class as the leader because there's a specific skill set there that I'm not going to be learning from whatever it is. Uh, and there's other models we can add to that, like form versus freedom practices, this is a really useful distinction. Some people are very, this is conservative liberal, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, some people are good at the sort of structure, the kind of organizing themselves, the discipline. Other people, it's the expression, the free movement. You know, like I was watching a group of yogis trying to do some free dance at a workshop and they, they were hilariously bad. I'm like, dancing is a fundamental cross-cultural human capacity. Like, you can't shake your ass. There's something wrong with you. Get thee to Brazil. You know, it was, it was embarrassing. <laughs> How, how stiff these kind of white English girls were. And it was, it was you know, there's cultural, you know, I'm alluding to cultural factors here too, in the certain cultures do certain parts of even formal freedom or certain parts, this model better than others. Personality factors are in there, you know, degree of openness versus degree of conscientiousness. Mm -hmm. And political factors are in there too. 
Uh, and then you'll get these weird combinations like a liberal person from the conservative culture doing conservative art. Yeah. You know, those, those sort of com combinations. Like, this sounds complex, but whenever someone I sit down with a student, and, and this is very practical for us, they're like, what do I do? Because they get, they get one thing, they, and we ask them to commit to six months to a practice so they don't just jump around. So first they get to go on a lot of sort of first dates, you know, like speed dating, and then they pick the practice. And we're, we're talking about all these factors. And sometimes it's very rational. It's very like, what's the skill you want to build? Okay, can you build that? And sometimes it's much more heart-led because at the end of the day, the practice someone does is always better than the one they don't do. Yeah. They're building any skill, right? And the last piece in this would be um, the, the how, the who, the where are as important as the what of the practice. So we've talked about the why of the practice. Mm -hmm concretely and you know more like values the what is the practice right but actually like i went to a jiu-jitsu club where everyone was like super respectful and that ethos and culture was an embodied teaching and i went to an mma club just around the corner that didn't have that yeah. and it wasn't the art it was the culture the who mm -hmm. and you know the teacher makes such a huge difference i'm always, I'd always say to people get the right teacher for the right art yeah. and even where you know you doing your stuff in nature in trees is utterly different than a indoor purpose-built park or gym under strip lights in an industrial unit, right? That's an entirely different embodiment that's going to be built by Hampstead Heath influencing us rather than, you know, a factory warehouse. Um, so now we're dealing with like a lot of complexity and it's really taken me some years to be able to coach people. I almost think there'll be, there's a future job, which is something like, um, it's like career consultant, but like practice consultant. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because unless you're taking into account these factors, and I can do it, you know, instantaneously in a matrix in my head now, you, you may well build the wrong muscle. Yeah, and that, that's that's fantastic. So this is exactly why I wanted to bring you on. Was this sort of like let's roadmap it out? And it sounds like you know you have a really strong roadmap already. Um, so that's really cool. I wanted to go back to something you said though, because it really oh. struck me. I think it's worth repeating for the audience. You said, if it doesn't get to the social and relational level, then you've missed the point. Can you, re is, do you remember what you where said? Yeah, that's, that's where life happens. What are your greatest pains and joys? Your children, your loved ones, your marriage, you know, making money, doing business. I mean, this is, this is life, right? Life is not sitting in a corner meditating. Yeah. Yeah. If it doesn't take you back and, and that happens that's another trap you know um i had a conversation yesterday with uh with a friend of mine and he was saying that i had you know he felt like i was kind of um uh, i was kind of poo-pooing mindfulness on the the, the podcast and i was like I don't, I don't think i was doing that what i was trying to illustrate is that at every level or every practice contains both gold um that you can that you can extract from it but also potential traps right it can take you away from 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 the whole human experience. And so with, um, with meditation, I've met people, uh, uh, the Pasna practitioners in particular, who have trained themselves to completely let go of all passion. Yes, and absolutely. Yeah, so so it's really, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, and this is intuitive, <laughs> like, who would you take as a lover, the salsa teacher or the meditation teacher, you know? Like, <laughs> Come on, you know, like this is intuitive. But again, I, I don't want anyone to hear with bad mouth for meditation. Actually, no. with my students, they, they're contracted for the year to all meditate and do something else. Now, why is it that meditations are one mandatory practice? Because that's the foundation. Yeah. Everything we're talking about is awareness based that defines embodiment as a field. Yeah. So that is the absolute most fundamental practice. It's the starting point. It's just not the end point. Not right, like meditation is absolutely what it comes back down to is you know if there's no you can't change what you don't notice. I think Feldenkrais said, like that's the beginning is mindful awareness. So this is this is one of my consistent practices that you know every this she's the only practice I do every single day without fail, even if it's just ten minutes on a train or a plane, because it's the foundation. And again, you can still ruin it with the how you know doing loving kindness in a hateful way, for example. And <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 it's a funny example, but for years I was like, like super yang competitive about my mm. metabolic kindness practice. And I was like, <laughs> and it was like, like triggered on me that I was like 
<laughs> it was all the opposite muscle that I was trying to by the bet. I was like, sit down no matter what, you know. Well, people get super competitive about it, you know. I want, um, you, to, I want you to watch a, a, a video when we're done with this conversation. I want the audience to watch a video. It's called, uh, it's Epic Rap Battles of History, Gandhi versus Martin Luther King. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah. 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 I'm going to love you so hard right now. <laughs> Well, that brings us actually to something quite interesting, which is a supplemental piece, which is the shadow of practice creates. Yes. So this isn't just an underdeveloped skill. This is a disidentified skill okay. or aspect of being. So for example, we're talking about competition, right? Why is a yoga rap battle funny? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do yoga competitions in my yoga workshop. And as soon as I mention it, everyone freaks the fuck out. And I'm like, guys, it's just part of life. It's part of nature. Animals kill and eat each other. Trees grow over each other you know, vines or strangle things. It's like, this is just part of life. It's no big deal. Let's become aware of it. You know, we don't have to get aggressive. And it's always the people who are like most like, I'm too spiritual for this. They're always the most fucking competitive. They're dangerously competitive. And you know, the Gracies said the same thing when they started teaching jujitsu, like the Aikido people were some of the worst at yanking people's arms off. Cause they, it wasn't just that they, cause they hadn't developed their relationship to competition. That they'd actually pushed it into shadow. And of course, the same could be said for you know a competitive kickboxer who's not not just not developing their sense of intimacy or care or uh, supporting others, but they're actually pushing it away, and they won't look at their own vulnerability. Uh, they won't look at their own you know need uh, need to express and give care. You know that's one we play with in yoga. We'll have someone hold up someone's arms doing warrior pose, and really explore their. And it's it's just amazing how quick the patterns come out. When you, when you change the frame and you know, I've, if you change the frame of what you're learning and what you're noticing, you could do practices you've done a hundred times, like a sun salutation or a keto move or you know, kickboxing, whatever. And all of a sudden like new stuff's there. And often, sometimes it's not for people to change their practice. It's just to bring a new perspective to it. Like if someone's already a yogi, and they're attached to that and they've got a yoga mat and they do yoga every morning. They've sort of done a lot of the hard work of getting a practice. So now let's just give that a little tweak sometimes. It's a better move than, um, you know, that's a better move than telling them they have to go do karate and they have to go for that again, you know? Yeah, that's one of the ideas I've been playing with in, you know, so there's, a, there's all of these practices. And then if you like tried to have an individual practice for each of these layers and you wanted to give like a real time to it all of a sudden you're talking about you know, <laughs> more hours than there are in the day right? welcome to our lives two hours, right? of two hours of contemplation two hours of parkour two hours of dance two hours of par uh, martial arts two you know you're not going to well, get just the movement side like you spend hours a day practicing just to get the movement side like relatively balanced right oh, and sorry. then i can come along and say yeah right but what about all these emotional social sides and it's like go so i think this this creates sort of like a real question of again back to values when when a resource is scarce, values become even more important. And the resource that's scarce for most people is time and for some money, right? For nearly all of us, it's time now. And as people have kids, run businesses, it's like, okay, so for me, a question becomes, how can I target what I'm practicing to most match my values? And secondly, how can I become really efficient? So when I work with business people, I'll give them one yoga pose to do for one minute a day. Yeah. Because fuck you if you say you haven't got one minute, yeah. right? Like, do you know what I mean? Or maybe three for one minute each, three minutes total, you know, or I'll give them a practice they can combine with their walking to work, which they do anyway. Um, so, so you can be skillful in how you put the practices into someone's life. It's like, okay, you already play squash. Okay, here's a breathing thing you can do before you serve. Okay, you have a shower every morning. Great. You can turn the shower to cold and practice self-regulation. Mm -hmm. So being skillful with how, you, you know, here's a practice you can do holding a baby while the baby is screaming. Right. So it's like being skillful with where people's lives are and being just being efficient. Like this is not a dirty word. I, I almost have like I can hear my voice almost like anger because it's like people are just wasting people's time. Like, you know, people came out of a 45 minute class I did in Berlin two nights ago and they're like, wow, that was like a year of therapy. And I'm like, yeah, because therapy shit at fucking <laughs> people's practices. Excuse my swearing, I'm getting Irish again. But it's it's not efficient. I can do that way more efficiently. And and I think talking about efficiency not as a dirty word, but as a way of sort of saying how do we not waste people's time 
it's not enough to say I'll just go and do you know Aikido for 10 years to get a black belt I ain't, I ain't got time to get another black belt these days nobody has yeah so I um so what, what I've been thinking about is okay you want to f- there's again the balance between you, you we've touched on this a few times but it's a really important idea there's a balance between like a logical articulation of what you're after and a respect for mystery and and tapping into underlying motivation and and letting it guide you in a open-ended fashion um yeah and, and there's is work called like masculine and feminine approaches or yin and yang and you know with some students just typologically I just say, you know, what can you fall in love with? Yes. And there's a middle ground called the arranged marriage. You know, like I have Pakistani British friends and they get kind of told like, okay, you have to marry one of these five girls, but you get to meet them. Mm -hmm. And which ones you get on well with, you know? And so it's not like most arranged marriages happen in the UK aren't like forced. They're, um, you know, there's some choice there. Um, They still go, where's their potential for love? So that's the kind of middle ground. And with some, I have to, just some students, I just go, you know what, what brings you, particularly if someone's got kind of a hard life, mm-hmm. you know, they've got a lot of suffering, maybe their wife's ill or their dad's got cancer or something, you know, it's just like, oh man, just like, what's going to bring you pleasure? And then let's open that up once your life's a bit more stabilized to some more challenging things. You know, right now you might want to have 90% pleasure, 10% challenge in your practice. Like, you know, after my dad died, I wasn't doing the embodied yoga principles poses that I needed to build as a muscle. I was just doing the stabilizing ones that helped me that felt good, that were familiar. And then at a certain point, I was like, okay, I can start reintroducing some challenge now because my life's got easier again. Yeah, yeah, I think the same thing happened for me right as I was creating Evolve Move Play, right? Mm -hmm. Left uh, the business that I had created, you know, had a lot of um, kind of, lost touch with a lot of people who are in the core of my community and my support structure for a while. Uh, Starting a a small business myself, had a baby, right? Like life was crazy. So my practice became a place where I just pursued something that felt really rich at the time. It's like I go into the and this is really deeply intriguing to me and I can escape and just completely access the flow state. And that was great for a while. But then there reached a point where it was like, it wasn't taking me far enough. And I had to add more structure in. I had to become more aimed. And I had to add that really challenging myself element in again. So I think it's really powerful to, to, to bounce or to, to flow between these, this more yin and this more yang side of your practice. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So and I think we're adding a lot of complexity in models and people could be kind of like listening to this going, Fuck, where do I start? And I'd say just even thinking a little bit about what you're trying to build and what you're doing. Even just having that question is already, you've already made a big step up from a lot of the sort of unconscious practice, which is what's going on. And, yeah. and again, I also, I kind of want to be like forgiving to people right as well. I want to be kind of like, generous and just be like you know whatever you on one level whatever you're doing is fine because it's a hell of a lot better than fucking you know just getting drunk on the couch every night or you know getting so angry that you're hitting your kids or something do you know what i mean like it's, it's like, you know if, if it brings you some joy enjoy it and in, in the culture which is really um movement starved sort of like any kind of movement or any kind of you know in a culture that's awareness dissociated you know then any kind of awareness practice is great so I, I, I kind of also want to say that to everyone. Like, if this sounds like, don't use this podcast as an excuse to give yourself a hard time or create more misery, right? That's not, that's not helpful. No, it's just, a, it's a, we're trying to serve the, the bigger idea of what practice can be. And then we're trying to do that in a way, we're trying to boil, I'm trying to boil it down to something that people can approach. So one of the ideas that I'm trying to, that I'm bringing up here is, uh, and, Okay, so you, you talked about find the practice that you fall in love with. So then now, now you have a practice. A practice is the place to start, right? If you would master all the arts, start with one, right? That's first love as well, right? Like listening to two different kinds of people are going to be listening to this. The people that haven't yet fallen in love with a movement practice and haven't yet gone down this path. And for those, like if, if I have a student who's like 18 and just getting curious about this stuff, I'm just like, just go fuck someone have a nice time, you know, like just go out there, do, do your thing, do your practice, stay safe, but do your practice. But if they come to me at 30 or 40 and they've already got a black belt or a yoga teacher training, it's a more sophisticated conversation, right? 
Yeah. And they've probably gone through a disillusionment process. That's the other thing is yeah. second love is difficult, different because you've been hurt. To stay with this analogy, you know, people coming to, you know, I've been disillusioned by Aikido. There's loads of people now in the world being disillusioned about yoga because of all the abuse scandals or they get involved in the politics or something or they realize it's not quite what it's the advertising suggests. And then it's real different. The, the, the challenge of cynicism is one, I would say, when you come to a second practice because you don't have that naive falling in love with it, thinking it's the best thing ever. I can't you know, any practice I go to now, I'm immediately seeing the holes in it and the culture and, you know, there's, there isn't that naivety there and um, that, that's a different challenge than the person who's just jumping mm -hmm. straight into something at 18 years old. Yeah, I mean, I've only uh, been in love once and, uh, and that's with my wife, but I've been in love, let's, well, I've only been in love with one person, um, but I've been in love with her multiple times. And, <laughs> And so there's a, you know, this is, I think this is an analogy for our practice as well, right? Like yeah. there's this initial honeymoon phase when you're, uh, when the potential for flaws is, is sort of invisible, when, when right. it is your everything and it can, and it, and it just, it, it's so engrossing, right? And then there's this point where it's, it can't sustain that forever. Well, yeah, cause, because you're projecting your own uh, shadow onto the practice or onto the wife or the husband. You know, you're projecting that you're a 16-year-old in love. You're amazing. I could never be like you. And, and then there's the, you know, also the cultural piece where we project onto other cultures. You know, people fall in love with the, the, the Japanese, you know, I've even seen Japanese, like, um, English Aikido instructors speak in a Japanese accent. I think I've said this <laughs> You know, it's just the most ridiculous affectation mm -hmm. and the, the sticking feathers up one's ass and thinking one's a chicken. Yeah. And then at some point, you, you either, people can get disillusioned with that and then, you know, be reowning, and this is a real theme in conservative politics right now, the reowning of one's own culture. Yeah. The reowning of one's own, own nature through, first of all, you know, this like falling in love with, which is very naive, lots of projection, lots of uh, affectation. And then, and then there's something about, you know, once you've been married and the toilet doors open and you kind of, you know, that what the smell of your partner's shit is like, you know, it's like there's something about that, falling in love at a deep level that's, that's interesting to me. Yeah, so in, in, in the marriage, there is, there's, there is going to be things that alienate you from your, your love right? Stuff's going to happen. Life's going to happen. And you're going to, the, the bond is going to get broken down and you're never going to be able to re-enter it with the same naivety that you had um, when you were young. But if you, but you can learn to actively engage with it in a way that allows you to re-engage the process of falling in love. So I would say that my wife and I have had honeymoon phases many times now, right? right. They come and go, but there's a, but there's a there's a recognition at some point that we have to proactively cultivate love in the same way i can look at my practice and say you know there was a time in which i had a honeymoon phase with with parkour um with martial arts and then there was times when it's like i i recognize that it's not everything and that you know it's hurting me <laughs> or i'm hurting myself it's through it two big, i want to just interrupt there's two big recognitions for people that are listening like one is it's not everything. And when I, when I tell yogis that, they can get real upset because it's really helped them. And it feels like I'm kicking their puppy by telling them it's not everything or it doesn't have all the, you know, the skill sets or the, you know, like competition, for example. Right? I gave that example earlier. It's not commonly part of yoga. Um, and the other one is actually recognizing that the thing that you love so much has hurt you. You know, I have real injuries on my body. I've got a broken shoulder from snowboarding. I've got things that just will never work again properly from martial arts. And, you know, also it can hurt your life, right? Like I know people who have ruined their marriages through going to tango every night and never seeing their partner. Mm -hmm. So they've ruined their actual romance to have all these little sort of weird, I don't want to say fake, but kind of weird little experiences of intimacy in tango on a nightly basis. And they've really trashed businesses and marriages and, you know, I know yogis who have meditators who have spent all their inheritance on meditation retreats and years later go, what? You know, wow, that, I could have started a business. I could have bought a house, you know, and, and the recognition that something that's helped us has hurt us is really tricky. I see this in abuse survivors a lot, you know, it's like they love the people who've abused them and it's really tricky. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I guess um, if we if we can see our practices in these ways, in that there's the, going to be a honeymoon phase, there's going to be disillusion phases, and then there's going to be an opportunity to re-engage with mm. more wisdom, but also giving your heart back to the practice. The, the other aspect of this is um, you can go like if we're trying to build this ecology of practices, you can stack things into one practice, right? Like I I will meditate in between um, activities when I'm, when I'm doing parkour. So I will, I will do, um, you know, if I'm doing very high intensity where I, uh, like sprints that are 20 seconds long, where my body needs a really long recovery period afterwards, I will use that period of time to just meditate. Right. right? Or I will meditate before or after the practice so that I stack the benefits. Um, it, you know, I, I had a conversation kind of along some of these same themes with Simon Tucker recently. And, uh, and we were talking about how Capoeira stacks community, um, it tacks, stacks folklore, it stacks music, it stacks dance and aesthetics and martial arts. All of these things, you get some benefit along them. And so it's a yep. practice that gives you a lot of these things. So you can stack your practices to some degree. But then one of the other aspects of this is um, you can go to a practice. So you could say, I'm a, I'm, I'm a parkour athlete or I'm a yogi. Now I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go as a parkour athlete for myself, I'm gonna go over and do some yoga. And I'm gonna pay attention to what I think is really good about that experience of yoga mm -hmm. and what is valuable. And then I'm gonna ask, can I change my practice over here in parkour in such a way that I can harvest those benefits? So just a little reframing, a little shift in the way that I'm approaching my training, and all of a sudden I can fill out that, that tree of the benefits that I'm trying to get without necessarily having to commit to too many more practices. Right, yeah, yeah. I feel like there's a balance here, isn't there? On the one hand, one practice can't do everything. Yeah. And to try and make it try, it's like trying to, you know, hammer in a nail with a screwdriver or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Like like you're using the wrong tool for the job. Um, but simultaneously, if we get too many practices, too much time, we spread ourselves too thin, we have to go through that painful learning curve in a new way, it's inconvenient. So it's like you know, the the sort of the minimal number to cover the main basis to build this actual skills you need in your life it might be something like a, a rubric for this, you know, the, and there's, there's kind of efficiencies, right? Like, is it more efficient to go do that in yoga or is it more efficient to go to incorporate that into what I already do, even though it's actually kind of not the right tool for the job, but I'm already doing that regularly. So I'm going to get practices. You know, another one I point people to is just the amount of time that's fruitful in your practice time so this is a big difference between doing aikido in england versus in japan I was, I was in japan last year people go do an hour of aikido they do one hour of aikido mm -hmm. and and also having things to do like if the teacher's just talking shit up the front and you can be meditating and feeling your body you know, i've got all these subtle in body tools you know one great thing about being super adhd is that i won't tolerate boredom yeah. so i've just got like a huge bag of little subtle tools that i can put in between so there's no space. If I do an hour of practice, it's an hour of practice. It's yes. not practice for a minute, have 30 seconds off, do something else. Um, so I think that's just a real simple, basic thing is like making sure your practice time is real practice time and, and having those little transferable, like you with the meditation, you know, the little windows. Um, and then there's also like, what, like what is really like a force majeure? Like what is really a necessity? You know, for example, I, I went to an AA meeting today. I have a, a practice of sobriety, uh, which is necessary for my continued survival. Mm -hmm. Right. So for me, that's a big one. And I make time for that. And even though there's a way in which, you know, going to 12 step meetings maybe isn't the most efficient practice in some ways for it. Um, there's a way in which it's too important for me to fuck around with and trying to, trying to get some sobriety through my yoga, which is possible you know, to, to incorporate some of that, but um, it ain't worth it for me. So I, I feel like, again, we come back to values, we come back to priorities here. Yeah, so there's a, um, one, of the, one of the models that, uh, that, um, that Verveke talks about is this model of what he calls um, cognitive, uh, cognitive tempering, which essentially comes down to, no, uh, actually, Sorry, I'm not sure if that's the thing, but, but the basic idea is that you have resiliency and efficiency. 
And resiliency comes from having redundancies. And efficiency is obviously about reducing redundancies. So you can say, okay, I can get my sobriety practice from, from, uh, from my, my yogic practice. And now my life is more efficient, but it's actually more fragile. You're relying on one thing for too many things. And also you're, um, you're, uh, you're maybe not getting all of the benefits, even though you've, you've tried to stack them into the other thing. And then on, over here, you say I could have, you know, maybe I'm, I'm doing um, uh, jujitsu and judo and samba, right? <laughs> and it's, it's great, but it's like, well, actually, the, the, the benefits that I'm deriving from, from each of them are overlapping to such a degree that it's very inefficient. Right. right. Is there a sort of whole foods versus supplement kind of conversation here around, um, I think it was someone on your show or other members, Katie Bowman, talking about this idea of movement whole foods, you know, versus movement supplements. I think and that's then, my idea. But um, Sorry, yeah. right? Very <laughs> likely, very likely. I think I heard it on your show when it was with your guest anyway. But I think that's, that's you know, another way of, mm -hmm. I mean, what we're really doing here is we're looking at ways of looking at this, right? We're giving people ways of, of approaching this, you know, um, because no one's really done the research. I mean, there's very little actual research on character growth through practice. Um, I'd love to see more out there. And there's so many variables that would be tricky to control for. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you could say you can say um, some of the research I've seen on yoga, for example, is very difficult because there's so many styles of yoga and so many different teachers, even within a style, that to say we gave some, you know, a control group sample of yoga is like it's very tricky to sell that in. <laughs> But, it, you know, until that reason, I mean, I'd love for there to be a huge university in the world that's just like working with, say, young people and just doing loads of research and, you know, really measuring personality traits over time. And you know, there's, there's so much potential research in this, I think. Yeah. And I think the mindfulness research has maybe kind of um, uh, started something like there is, you know, yoga research happening now. And uh, there's, uh, I think other things will start getting included in that because it's so, you know, as we move towards wrap up, you know, it's so obviously the case that uh, martial arts help young people's character development, for example. But this is, this is the reason why people are busting their kids to jujitsu or judo classes or whatever, right? The parents are seeing it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think getting a bit more rigorous about that would be helpful and maybe some of these models would be, would be useful for that. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I think, you know, going back to the articulation, what is it that we need when we say character? right what are, what are the elements of character if we can say okay um you know you talked about self-regulation right uh, self-awareness self-regulation social awareness social regulation um you know then we can you know i i would think in the sense of you know i tend to think in the sense of like core uh you know i guess courage right sensitivity empathy well, there are sets of universal virtues yeah, that people have exactly. virtually culturally, right? There's a whole body of work in philosophy and cross-cultural studies on, yeah. you know, it's these virtues that are universally considered noble things. I think that's another way you could go with, with the kind of research on this. You know, I, I could have mapped embodiment around virtues. I decided to map it around skill sets. I find that very practical. Yeah. Um, very concrete. But I think that would be a really nice way of mapping embodied practices like okay parkour is great for courage but maybe not so great for this or whatever you know? exactly so like within within the evolved move play set of practices we look at parkour as uh, a place where you develop courage and a relationship with fear is really one of the primary things it's also really powerful for cultivation and tapping into flow states um in a way where you can control that really deeply and then um it, there's a lot of self-expression and creativity creative problem solving, which are all really useful skills. So then we're also interested in like sensitivity and communication. And this is something that we don't really see through parkour. So that's where we bring in things like martial arts and contact uh, improv, which it doesn't have to be contact improv. There's lots of forms of dance that are really good for that. Contact improv is particularly interesting because of the um, mutually additive relationship rather than the lead follow relationship and the fact that it's partnering. But it's a, it's a place where we're going to start to develop sensitivity to another person and empathy and emotional regulation through social interaction. Yeah. Great. And this is, yeah, it, it, this could also, it's like, you know, what could you innovate, right? Like let's say you wanted to work with social communication skills. 
in parkour, well, you know, you could have a kind of exercise where one person was only allowed, it was had to get through an obstacle course, get through a, a run, only doing things that they were told to do by the other person. Yeah. You know, just created that right now as a little exercise. You could use communication skills for parkour. Or, you know, obviously you could practice flirting with squirrels and trees. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's, 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 there's ways in which you could oh, be man, creative. that tail is very fluffy. That is, damn, red squirrel. We never see red squirrel tail anymore. <laughs> All right. um so there's you know if you give me a virtue or give me a skill set i'll give you a yoga exercise for five minutes where, where you can use it so i think creativity comes into this um for sure yeah yeah so um well actually i think this would be an interesting exercise it's popping in my head so you you've said you know you, you have you have your schema for how well, the type of practices that you that you kind of recommend for people. So I, I'm just curious, right? Like analyze me, right? Um, if, you, if you look <laughs> at me, you know, you, we've had a lot of conversations now yeah, yeah, yeah. behind the scenes as well. You've come and, and trained with me. You're like, yeah. if Rafe is, is missing something, what is the practice that would help me most fill in and strengthen what I'm already doing? Okay, let me just tell you how I think about this because that's going to be more useful to you and others than just <laughs> telling you what I think is your mate, right? right? So I could look at this like, what are your current competencies, the things you're already good at, and then I just miss, look for the missing points. So I go, okay, this guy knows how to fight, he knows how to run, he can dance. Okay, so what might be missing? Maybe comedy, you know? Maybe it's like, the guy takes himself pretty seriously. Maybe aesthetics, like, okay, most times I see you're wearing pretty fucking scruffy clothes, you know? Like, you're obviously not from Milan. And neither am I, brother, so, you know, yeah. get it. But like, maybe there's an aesthetic practice, like tango is an aesthetic practice. It's about musicality, you know, like, I, have I, do I hear you talk about music a lot? You know, that's a weak spot for me as well, right? So that's one way I can analyze it, just looking at kind of current strengths and going, okay, what's missing? Another way would be like some sort of personality thing. So we use a four elements model, which is just a kind of simple typology people can understand. And I might say, okay, so what does he do that's earthy, like structured, organized, systemic, what does he do that's watery, like um, flowing, you know, receptive, responsive? What he does is fiery, so it's about passion and fierceness. And what does he do is airy, that's about kind of humor and spaciousness and creativity, right? Mm -hmm. And you might, you know, we'd have that conversation, and I almost certainly wouldn't tell you what to do because it wouldn't work, right? You wouldn't stick with it. But you'd go, you know, I was talking to a student today, and she was like, you know what, I'm really watery. I'm, you know, I work with people, I'm very caring. and but you know and i'm kind of creative but my life's sort of a mess um and oh, this is another way to work what is the problems in your life and i'm not sure we want to do this online because it's quite revealing but i'd say you know like what's the stress point for you like in your marriage your business you know what's fucking up and then we'd look at what's the missing underlying capacity for that mm -hmm. so it might be like my finances are a complete mess I'm all over the place I'm like, okay lots of air not enough earth Let's give him a structure practice. So, you know, I gave this to a student today. Like, here's a little practice you can do. Co-created it with her. You know, it's something that she could actually do in her life that she you know, came up with the idea herself, the specifics. Um, so that would be another way to go, would be uh, to look at actual real problems and go, okay, what would be a practice that would build the muscle that would uh, give you the skill that you're currently um, disabled in, you know, you're currently retarded in? Yeah, it's interesting. You, you mentioned comedy right away, which is something I've actually thought about as like improv or or com comedy. It's interesting because I, I I crack quite a lot of jokes and I have a very intense sense of humor um, in my personal life. But I think that as a coach, I'm I come off very seriously, and also in these podcasts, like um, there's not a lot of humor to them. Pretty heady, heady pretty intellectual, and, and that's what I call bright spot moving. So you might be really good at say flirting with your wife. Now, yeah. I'm not saying you should like flirt with all your students, but a little bit of that energy sometimes is actually really healthy for a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, you might be really good at being creative in this way or humorous in this way. Like I didn't used to make any jokes when I taught. And then one of my students was like, you know, you were really funny at lunch. Why don't you do that when you're teaching? And I had this like story that you should, you had to be serious when you taught, you know? And I was doing corporate and I was like, this is what I have to do taken seriously. And as soon as I actually just took that bright spot and brought it into my work, it very quickly got enlivened by it. So that, that's a slightly different thing than not having the capacity. It just means the capacity hasn't been transferred. And yeah. then we might practice to transfer that. 
you know, it might be like something that reminds you of that way of being that you can kind of bring to mind or a little practice, you know, you can bring into your teaching or whatever. So that's, that's a slightly different approach, all valid. I mean, a lot of this is pretty unique, right? Like I can't give anyone an algorithm for this exactly. Oh, the other thing that I do, you might like I was doing this today with a coachee, um, using the capacity they have to get to ones they don't have. Mm -hmm. so, and their value as well. So I have a, a student who's very caring. She works, does some care work type stuff. Very, I might say, water or yin. And um, it was looking at, and she wanted to be more earthy, more kind of structured and organized. So what we did was say, okay, your value is care. Can you connect to what you care about in order to motivate you to do this practice that's difficult? Or she's really good with other people. So I said, is there someone you can role model who you can kind of, you know, take in that quality of earthiness from them? Because this is what she does anyway. This is what she does accidentally and fucks her up because she's taken on other people's qualities. So I said, okay, can we use that em empathy that you're really good at to get the thing you're not good at? And I, there's two or three other strategies, but they were all based around, okay, so you're a caring person. Do you see how violent it is to yourself not to learn this skill? Yeah, yeah. So she was able to really get like, oh shit, now it's connected to both my values, care, and my strength. I'm really good at caring for people, so I should fucking care for myself, not just other people. Because I'm good at that and I, it matters to me. And then we, we sort of hijacked her you know, current capacity to get to the other one. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Using the strength to build a weakness is a, uh, yeah, it's classic. I think that's, that's wonderful. So um, I know you have to leave pretty soon. So I think that it would be nice just to, you know, we've covered a lot of ground and I think you've offered a lot of really great insights. Um, but I think we, it would be nice to just sort of sum it up for the students and talk about here, here are the takeaways, right? So I'll, I'll regurgitate it back to you and you tell me um, kind of how well I comprehended what you were offering, but it's like, we can, we can look at all of our practices as, uh, as, as places to cultivate character. We can, we can do that from a skills perspective, right? We can, you, you, you laid out, um, you know, social aware or personal, right? Awareness, regulation, social awareness and regulation. Is that your four? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Daniel Goldman essentially just widened just emotions. Yeah. We can also look at that from the idea of, of specific virtues for the students or for the listeners. What they can do is go back basically and write out the virtues that are, that are meaningful to them or write out the skills that are meaningful to them and then ask the question, how do these different practices donate to them? Great. So do my current practices build that? Is there a shift of perspective or do I need to new practice? Yeah. And then they can, they can, uh, they can use the entry point if they're, if they're beginning or, or whatever there is of their primary practice, find something that they love and build through that. Find how much you can import in by going out there and finding other things, but seeing if they fit, but don't become so efficient if you have to adopt new practices. Great. So this is the mapping of the sort of masculine side of what we do. And then also, we also acknowledge there's a kind of mystery and a flow and a poetry and intuition and a kind of falling in love process that's as valid and as important as this um, kind of structure of, you know, how to choose a practice. Yeah, absolutely. So follow, uh, follow the, that, that sense of love and also practice awareness of where it's taking you. Yeah, check that it's not check that it's not just like it like if I have a deep intuitive sense that I need chocolate and blowjobs, I might want to check that. <laughs> so um is there anything that you'd like to add that the, uh, the students can take away as a or the um the the listeners can take away as a practical expression, this idea of road mapping, an ecology of practices that can help people engage in self-cultivation and self-transcendence. We also talked about the sort of jitsu versus do fundamental distinction, the ontological frame of the body that it's building a way of being. You know, what is the being that's being built here? It's, it's, it's uh, complementary to the skills perspective. Uh, this idea of um, transfer and container. Um, mm -hmm. Also, this idea of increasing complexity of sort of from just awareness to awareness of movement, to awareness of movement and relationship to. A verbal, financial, or sexual challenge being added into that. Yeah. Um, and having some sort of points along each of those because they won't necessarily transfer, 
I think we could also kind of add to that word called bridging practices. So there'd be like things like dropping bits of meditation in the day or um, uh, one I use for yoga is I kind of go, okay, okay, in, in the 30 minutes after the class, am I employing what I just learned? So I'm blurring the boundaries of the container a little bit. So I'm bringing some of that awareness into the next half an hour of my life, uh, which isn't, um, it's still more lifelike than the class. It's less contained, but it's, it's giving some focus to, to a sort of limited space of time. I mean, I can give resources as well for people. There's an ebook on like making yoga meaningful, mm-hmm. somewhat provocative style, but that's all these principles applied to yoga, but every single one of them applies to any uh, skill that's out there. So that would be the, and there's, there's a, a podcast on, on my podcast on the same thing where people, we probably forgot a few. I think you articulate as well as, as well as I can and probably more concisely. So thank you. But there's a couple of resources for people. Beautiful. Um, so for folks who are really interested in this and are interested in learning more from you, Mark, uh, what do they need to know? Uh, the embodiment podcast, if you like podcasts and rates been on that and a bunch of other cool people. We've had about 170 guests, um, including movement culture people. And you know me, I like to like to have fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ken Wilbur was the latest one. Um, yeah. And then um, in terms of courses, I mentioned embodied yoga principles for the yogis out there. I also work with coaches. The year long course I mentioned is called the Embodied Facilitator course. Okay. Um, currently running out of Russia and the UK. We have people from this year from Japan, Saudi Arabia, North America, South America. Um, it's got an online face to face component. It's full for this year, but the date's already out for next year if people want to hold the dates. That's if you know if you want to go hardcore into it, that's EFC. And then there's loads of free shit on YouTube as well if people prefer visual. So um, I think that gives people more than enough um, potential stuff. If, if you put my Walsh embodied into the internet, then lots of stuff comes back. Beautiful. Okay. Well, I think that's a good place to stop because I know you have to run real quick here. Um, I thought this was fantastic. I thought this was really insight dense and I want to just thank you once again for coming on the podcast, Mark. Oh, mate, it's always a pleasure. I feel like every time we talk, we both walk away kind of smarter and stronger with new ideas. So, um, you know, every time we have a private conversation, I'm walking down the street in Brighton, WhatsApp phoning you, I feel like it should be public. So, yeah. um, always open to doing these and I really like you had a targeted theme here and I feel like it's a value to people so um yeah I mean people can let us know right I'm open to feedback as well but um yeah I enjoyed it for sure awesome okay Cheers, man. I'm gonna run. take care bye-bye thanks for listening to the Evolve Move Play podcast if you want to support what we're doing make sure to like share subscribe and hit that notifications button so you know what's coming up and of course the biggest support you can give is to become a patreon supporter this is what's going to allow us to grow this platform more than anything else so this is entirely listener supported and we really appreciate your support and we look forward to talking to you again soon